that, would you stand with me this evening? I believe we're fortunate and blessed so we happen to have a pastor who is a witness to those things. There's a lot of voices out there that it's all right. But I'm glad we have a first, a first witness Amen. account. Amen? Someone who could say, I was there. I saw it. I know what happened. I just appreciate that in Brother Green. And we're not doing this because you're here, Brother Green. We really feel that way. How many appreciated what he had to say this morning? I really did. Amen. I was blessed this morning. So as he comes, pray for him that God increase his strength. For he is Lord as our pastor comes tonight. For he is Lord. appreciate you folks praying for me and you know some people who haven't experienced it or tried it they may say sometime well it doesn't seem like it take much strength to stand up and talk well i just like to say this in defense of that why don't you try it sometime uh not only the strength that that goes but the courage it takes to do it uh and then then the the backlash or the or the comments that come back they're not always complimentary and uh but but if you can't stand the heat i say get out of the kitchen uh it's the same thing the same answer i'd give these people who want to criticize brother branham for because he said something that they don't understand or can't prove by some other witness why don't they say something why don't, why don't they try sometime uh when when they've uh, when they've done just one one thousandth percent of everything that Brother Branham's done, then they might might have an opportunity to be justified. I won't say they will, but they might have an opportunity to uh, to criticize something that he's done or said. Uh, there's just too many things as evidence that that Brother Branham was the fulfillment of Malachi four, five, and six. Amen to come along and take one or two things that you don't understand and try to say he wasn't. And, and I tell you, I think it's a dangerous thing to be critical of anybody in the ministry. In fact, the scripture says that they'll be blameless. Now, you can't, you can't argue with me, or you can, but you, you have no justification there either to say that that means that the preacher has to be perfect. Because there's none good, no, not one. We know that. We, we, all of us ministers will confess that if we're honest. Yes, sir. But to, when it says that to be blameless, it means that they're not open season for you to criticize. I don't even get one amen on that. Amen. Did, you, did you understand what I said? Yes. When, when a man's trying to deliver what's, what's a sincere conviction on his heart, and he's trying to state the truth of the gospel... Uh, he, he's not open season for you just to pick apart. Uh, you, you may say, well, I, I mean it sincerely, but you know, you may be sincerely wrong yourself. Uh, it's awful easy for you to uh, pick on somebody that's doing something and you're not doing anything. You may say, well, give me a chance. Well, why didn't God give you the position to try to start off with? Uh, we got challenged here just early part of this year because there's somebody who wanted to come here and preach. And I wasn't available to make the decision. And Brother Caleb asked me, and I told him, I said, well, I just, what's the motive of a person wanting to preach? Uh, can, can they say they've got something that's thus saith the Lord to a congregation? Or do they just want an offering? If they do that, let's just give them one. Do we have to endure uh, you know, I remember something Brother Samuel Johnson said when he was here that he said he thinks the worst way in the world to die is to be drugged to death. 
And you know, you take a preacher and you just get up and he don't have anything to say, but just keep dragging you through it, you know. That's a slow death. Uh, even I felt bad this morning, realized I'd, I'd spoken almost for two hours. And so I appreciate the kindness of you folks that love me enough, or else you were sincere enough to come tell me it didn't seem like two hours. Well, it didn't to me either. I'd have quit earlier. <laughs> I'll have to say that I was enjoying what I was doing this morning. And said. Now, there, there are a lot of things I said this morning that after I got through, I wish I wish I hadn't said that, or I wish I'd have made that clear, or I hope I didn't hurt somebody's feelings. But then there's just about that many that I said, you know, I forgot to tell them that. I forgot to say this. And uh, I don't know if the other brothers are this way, but I think they are because we're all about normal. And that is that, that we prepare these sermons yes. and we, we listen to the thoughts that God gives us. And then I want to believe that's the leadership of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And these thoughts that come and then uh, somewhere or another I learned in life to uh, prepare for your sermon like you had no God. And then when you get up to preach it, depend on God like you had no preparation. You follow that? And, and anybody that's as old as I am and uh, been the privilege to see and hear as much as I have, we've always got something to say. Whether you like it or don't like it, whether it comes out right or not, there's usually something to talk about. And uh, this subject of uh, Brother Branham being the prophet and the fulfillment of Malachi 4 or 5, I can't make you believe that. I can't convince you of that, but I can tell you why I believe it. Amen. And then it's up to you whether you can understand that or not or get a revelation of it. And uh, I've been accused of a lot of times of not teaching the message. Well, I don't feel like that's been my calling. I, I never have claimed to be a teacher in this message. And in fact, I can give you a couple of quotes. Brother Bram said the teacher is the one that caused all the problems. If I can teach you a revelation, then uh, somebody else can teach you one. But my feeling is, and my conviction, and I feel like my calling has been, that if, that if I can tell you honestly from my heart what I've seen and heard, and in any way it helps you to understand and get a revelation of your own, that Brother Branham was the fulfillment of Malachi 4, and you believe his message is important, you'll get that message. I've made the statement, you'll get it if you have to steal it. Because I believe it's his message what's important. I'd say it's as important as, uh, as believing that he is that prophet. But I want to make this very clear. I don't believe God does anything in vain. Now, why did he have the prophet Isaiah... Talk about the voice of one crying in the wilderness and then send John the Baptist the way that he did introduced by an angel to his father in the Holy of Holies and have all the things that occur that happened in the life of John the Baptist if he wasn't important. He was to prepare the way of the Lord. Now I want you to analyze that in your own thinking, your own logic and stop and say well now what did John the Baptist do that contributed to people recognizing Jesus, who he was? Well, first of all, just read in your Bible and see how many people it were that followed Jesus. And you'll see that all of them that I can read about heard John's message. They were stirred about his message. Now, some of his disciples did not follow Jesus, but most of them did. He was to do what? To forerun. Amen. Now, in the same case, if Brother Branham was given a commission to, with a message to forerun the second coming of the Lord, is it important to hear his message? Yes. If that's the case, then we not only should hear it, but we should be obeying it. Yes. And we shouldn't let one part of it that we follow and obey and believe cause us to disobey some of the other part of it. And I don't think you'll find any place where Brother Branham ever said anything that would please him if you didn't love one another. Or you just fellowship somebody because they differ with you. I want you to know I think that uh, 
Well, I, I've said this before. One, one night I was over at the North Side Assembly and years ago, and I read their financial statement on the on the bulletin board, which I appreciated. And uh, I counted up then, and I think there was about four churches in Tucson. And I mentioned this to the other pastors. I said, what would Brother Branham say if he were to come back now? Well, I told him, I said, first of all, I want you to know I think he'd come to my church. I think he would attend my church because he said, this is my church. Now, of course, I, I was kidding them, but I think there's a serious note there. I don't think Brother Bradham would be pleased to see us churches divided and split up. I can't, I can't see that how it would be that uh, Brother Bradham would come back and say, well, now, that you did the right thing. You, you just fellowship Brother Green. You went somewhere else. You see, I don't think I can live like that. I don't think I can disfellowship one now that differs with me. And I, I know I couldn't if I'd have been a part of that body that they were to start off with. And that's one thing that I don't have to put up with in my own conscience, is that I have left another church. But there's some that they don't want to claim any association whatsoever with Tucson Tabernacle, past, even when there wasn't anybody else here but us, and now. And, and I'm not condemning them, and the way that I've kept that out of my heart is I've told you people in the past that when somebody's come to me and told me they wanted to go to church somewhere else or they wanted to start one, to keep it out of my heart, I've tried to help every one of them. I said, do you need, a, you need a building? You need a PA set? You need a pulpit? You need pews? You need a piano? And notice all of them start with a P. Yeah. And then I concluded, and I'll give you some people if you let me pick them. I try to finish it on a note of humor so that they won't be fighting mad when they leave because that's the truth. There's not a, there's not a, a sister church in this city that there's not somebody attending that congregation that I have not recommended to them to go to there. When they come and talk to me and they tell me how they feel, I say, well, why don't you go there? If that makes you happy and you feel like you're closer to God there, I suggest you do it. But just promise me you won't preach against us. Don't disfellowship us. And if you find something that makes you love God more and have a burden for souls, then please come back and tell us. I've only had two do that. Now, I don't, I don't think it's right to do it any other way. It's strange, but almost every one of them says, I want to go someplace where I can be closer to God. So when somebody leaves the tabernacle and they go somewhere else to be closer to God, and then I hear they've left and gone somewhere else, then I want to know if they've gotten closer to God. You see, first of all, we need to be honest with ourselves. And, and, and one of the major problems we have is that when we leave a church... We can't leave our major problems behind. We take them with us. That's ourselves. I don't. I don't think that I personally would be happy if I if I couldn't worship with all the others. I don't go as often as I would even like because I've been made to feel unwelcome, and I've been told by some of them that I'm not welcome. And when somebody tells me I'm not welcome, I don't want to go and cause them a problem. Now, I, I must be a problem to them because they don't make me feel welcome and they don't want me there, even a funeral. And when somebody tells me that, I try not to aggravate them. But there's never been one that I've told you folks not to go to. Uh, you don't know how it made me feel last Sunday when Brother Bennett made the announcement about this website that we're talking about this week. I, I can't ever remember telling you, don't do that. I've always felt that, that you can't deceive the elect because the elect cannot be deceived. If you've got a revelation of it, the gates of hell won't prevail against it.
This morning I spoke to you about the bridge and the things that happened in Brother Bam's early childhood that to me he himself offered as evidence that he was called of God to do what he was doing. Now, ju just, just this week when my office flooded, uh, we, we got some of the boxes under my desk got wet, and I discovered this copy of the Life magazine that I've had for years, and I can remember the first time I ever saw a copy of this magazine. It was in May, the week of the 17th of 1963. Uh, I lived in Beaumont, Texas, and I had read the Life magazine, the Look magazine, the Time magazine, U.S. News and World Report, and those since I had gone to college. And when I read this article in one of the Life magazines, and I saw the picture of this cloud, I said then, that's interesting. I did not know it had anything to do with Brother Branham, but I looked at it and I said, if there is no explanation and it's that high, then it has to be supernatural. And in my mind, the thought came to me that it, it said something about Jesus coming in a cloud. Amen. You, ever, you ever remember reading that in your Bible, in the Gospels? And I connected it then to the coming of the Lord. Of course, the page before, there was something about some moonbeams. Now, I, I had seen the northern lights before in my travels at that time. But this one, I, it impressed me and I remembered it. Now, the early part of 1964, when I had Brother Branham for some meetings in Beaumont, I was told by the brothers and sisters that had followed Brother Branham for years that this cloud was from some angels that appeared to Brother Branham. Well, I had no trouble connecting that in, in my thoughts. Well, Brother Branham is somebody that, even though I didn't have a revelation that he was Malachi 4 at that time, he, Brother Branham, had said that some angels came to him and formed this cloud. I didn't have any difficulty accepting that fact, even though I didn't know all the details of it. But I did see that it was February the 28th. Now, I'm going to fast forward a little while because I want to tell you some things that's happened in the meantime. Now, this is a calendar that was sent to me last year. It's the calendar of 2011, and it's called the Message Calendar 2011. And it's produced by the believers of Western Australia. Now, I, I know the people in Western Australia. I know Brother Ashley Campbell that did live in South Africa. That he had to move out of South Africa and go to Perth, Australia. Because of something that happened. That he preached and taught in South Africa. That the people had no confidence in him. And he, he immigrated from South Africa, from uh, Cape Town, all the way over to Perth, Australia. That's just across the Indian Ocean, or in the South Atlantic, in the Indian, uh, before, to go to South Africa. Brother Ashley Campbell had come to Tucson to see myself with Brother Willie Retief and Brother Unduplices and Brother Theo Erasmus. The four of them came here together. And they came here to convince me that Jesus had come. In, in South Africa, there is a mountain there that the Christians over there had put rocks up on it like a mountain down here and it whitewashed them and it said, Jesus is coming. Now, Brother Campbell and some of those brothers over there had climbed up that mountain and had changed that to say, Jesus has come and publicized it, well, of course the newspapers picked it up and said Jesus is coming and these brothers came along and wrote articles about it and said that Jesus is coming is gross error. 
And they came to Jeffersonville, and the brothers there didn't make them welcome. They came here to Tucson, and I made them welcome because I had met them when I was in South Africa. Uh, they didn't agree with me, and I didn't agree with them because I told them I felt they were wrong. That I didn't believe that Jesus had come. And they're the first ones that mentioned to me about the seven angels coming, and that was the coming of the Lord. Uh, they were staying over here in the Ramada Inn, which is now the in-town suites, and I was going to take them out to uh, Pinnacle Peace to eat at night. And they came to the house, and Brother Ashley Campbell, he preached that because the Lord had come, we were not to have communion anymore. Because Jesus had said, this do until I come. And because he had believed that Jesus had come, then he wasn't having any more communion. But just before he'd come to Tucson, he had preached a sermon to his church that a man and his wife were not to have any more relationships because they were past that. They were in the millennium. And when the brothers told me that, I listened to them, and we went by my home out on 18th Street then, and I just casually said to Brother Ben, Brother Ashley, uh, Brother Ashley, is it okay if I kiss my wife goodbye? And he said, oh, sure, sure. And I turned to him and I said, Brother Ashley, I said, when you left home, did you kiss your wife tiny goodbye? He said, yes, I did. I said, well, I want to tell you something, brother. You're a much better man than I am. If you can kiss your wife and not lust after her, you're a better man than I am. And we went out to Pinnacle Peach and we ate. And they quizzed me about the tent and and everything like that that they believed had happened. And, and, and they're the first ones who ever really put the pressure on me to believe that Jesus had come in 1963. Well, we had just started doing the black bound volumes of the spoken word books. And we were up through about volume four or five. And the next morning before I took them to the airport, I went to their hotel room over here and I gave Brother Campbell a set of those bound volumes. And when I went to shake his hand, he slapped his hand away from mine. Well, there were two of the brothers with him. When they saw that, they felt that was wrong. And, and and they told me later, Brother Green, that's when we saw that Ashley may have a great revelation, but he had a wrong spirit. Well, I gave Brother Ashley this advice. I said, Brother Campbell, you may believe what you believe about the coming of the Lord. And you may believe no more communion and no more marriage relationships. But let me give you a piece of advice. Don't you have any relationships with your wife? Because if your people find out that you preached that and then didn't live it, they're not going to leave you, keep you around anymore. Well, they went from here to New York, and from New York they went home. The night that they got home, they got home about 2 o'clock in the morning. No more than Brother Campbell had got to his house that he called Brother Thuy Erasmus and Brother Duplessis and Brother Willie Retief and wanted a meeting that night then and have the brothers of the church meet them at Brother Retief's home. And what had happened is when Brother Campbell got home, his wife told him he thought she, she thought she was pregnant. And this may be plain, but most of you are married people. But while he was coming to confess it to the brothers, his wife's period started. If it had been another hour, he wouldn't have been caught. But as a result of his hypocrisy, he now lives in Perth, Australia. And he published this calendar. And in here... He put Brother Brown's pictures, and he put all the quotes that he, the ones that says what he wants it to say, 
And you know, you can take the Bible and prove that God is a duck. Covered with feathers and so forth and so on. And in this calendar, he got pictures of the cloud with Hoffman's face inside of it. Now, I know that's man-made. When that cloud was taken in the sky, it looked like this. I have a slide that I bought from the photographer that took it with written permission to duplicate it. It appeared like this. This is the way the cloud looked. And not only from that, but this picture here was printed in August by brothers in Mexico. And when you look at it, it's got Hoffman's picture in it too. And they teach that this proves that Jesus came back and the scripture was fulfilled of his second coming of 1963 because they've seen this picture. Nobody has told them this is man-made. And when somebody like myself goes there and tells them this is man-made, they do you like they did me in the Congo. They boo you. They know that that's Jesus. Brother Bram said it was Jesus. But not with that, halo, not with those, that cloud picture around his head. Now, I feel that I have a right to say this is false. And because others have done this website and they've stood for things like that in the past, now they've got to discredit Brother Branham and prove he was wrong because they were so wrong when they said something Brother Branham didn't say and something is false. Leave off the bridge. Leave off the cloud. Take the mountain of evidence that proves Brother Branham was a prophet. All the visions he had, all the healings he had, all the other prophecies that he gave, and you're going to have to say all of them were false. And this is what they say in this website. That if some of them were wrong, how do you know the others were not wrong? I want you to know that's very dangerous preaching. It's blasphemy. It's an abomination. It stinks in the nostrils of God. Therefore, as Brother Branham would say, let me hear my voice saying that's wrong. Most of these things, when somebody does something like this, I have had the opportunity to either be there when it went off, and, and, and I can do almost all of the doctrines, the tangent doctrines. I, I went and sat down with Brother Coleman. For hours. Let him tell me why he believed the thunders. I'm still waiting for an explanation. I believe he was a wonderful man. And I believe he loved God. But I personally think he was deceived. Because he tells a story about being in Puerto Rico. Sitting and listening. And he said a voice spoke to him and told him to pick up a book. The church age book that was edited by Brother Vale and read a certain paragraph, and I believe it's on page 124, where Brother Bram said, These things are not even written. But then Brother Bram talks about some things that are going to happen. He said, And I think we'll find where they are written. Later on, we'll find where they are written. And Brother Coleman takes those two thoughts and said, Brother Bram said, we'd find where it's written. How can you find anything written about the thunders that's not even written at all? 
To me, Brother Brown was talking about finding a promise to where the bride will have these gifts. If I couldn't give an explanation of it, I'd repent of what I say. Whenever they, they wanted to show that a pillar of fire had appeared. When Brother Coleman had said, let the fire fall in South Africa. And at that time, there was a flash of light. And the person that was take, videotaping it, they, they, the flash of light, they led it back. And he came and Brother Coleman was standing in the middle of that pillar of fire. And that's where it started that they believed that he was the archangel. Brother Isaac Norrig and I were coming home from Switzerland to, to a cousin's funeral. Brother Noriega came on home, but I stayed in New York one night, and Brother Coleman took me to his church. And he told me that they had spent $10,000 putting a PAL system in their church. And they had, you see, PAL is what's in Europe, and NTSC is what's in America in the Western Hemisphere. And they had installed the PAL TV sets up where you could see it in the balcony and down here. And he seated me up in the balcony to where I could see uh, the one closest to me. And he played me that videotape from South Africa. And when I saw it, he just, that clip of it, he asked me what I thought. And I said, Brother Coleman, I'll be honest with you. I have... I've never seen anything like that before. Now, let me say right here, but he told that story every time he told it about me. His brother Green said, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Well, I was just honest. I never did see anything like that. So I asked him that day to let me watch it again. I watched it three times. And I came up with the same conclusion. I had never seen anything like it. So I couldn't express an opinion. Well, about three weeks later, I bought my first video camera. It was one that you, you carried on your shoulder, and you had the camera attached to about a 10 or 12-foot cord. And we were having a wedding here at the church. And my baby daughter, Tina, was living at home, and she brought that camera and recorder to this church for the rehearsal. And she came back home at night and said, Daddy, there's something wrong with that camera and recorder. Because tonight when I, when I videotaped the candle lighters, the candles, they, the candle light came back down the aisle of the tabernacle. And I says, well, maybe there's supposed to be some kind of a filter or something on, on the lens. The next day... I took the camera and the, the recorder back to Rose Magnavox. They were out on Broadway then. And Mr. Rowe and his mother told me, said, Oh, Brother Green said, said any time with these video cameras that there's a bright light hits the camera, the lens, said it burns itself in there and it stays there until it's run long enough that it erases itself. Well, I said, that's the answer that Brother Coleman wanted me to give him. So I loved him enough that I called him on the phone. And I tell him what I found out. And that was the breaking point between Brother Coleman and myself and the Thunders people until this day. Because I would not accept that flash of light that was a flash bub on those people and with that old camera it followed itself back until Brother Coleman was standing in the middle of it. A few months after that, National Geographic magazine published an article on this and showed where people was believing these things, and I sent those articles to those people. I didn't disfellowship them, but I went to Toledo, Ohio, when they had their meeting there, and they were, Brother Coleman was to bring the revelation of the seven thunders. And I sat there with seven other brothers, Brother McHugh's and Brother Marconda and Brother uh, Lee Vail. And 
None of them was convinced and neither was I. But it was at that meeting that I found out that Brother, Col Brother Lee Vale was going to Europe. And I asked him if he would go to Europe, if he, when he went to Europe, if he would go by and see Brother Ewald Frank. And Brother Vale said, I hate that man. I don't want nothing to do with him. And Brother George Smith was there, and Brother Galdona was there. And they both spoke up and said to Brother Vale, you can't hate anybody, Brother Vale. That makes you a murderer. Lee said, yep, that makes me a murderer. I'm a murderer because I hate Ewald Frank. I came home and I asked Brother Harold Morconda if he would accompany Brother Vale on that trip. And I paid the way for Brother Harold and his wife to make that trip with Brother Vale to make sure that Brother Vale went by to see Brother Frank. Brother Vale would not have anything to do with Brother Frank. But instead of Brother Morconda influencing Brother Vale, Brother Vale influenced Harold Morconda, and Harold Morconda came back here and wanted nothing to do with me, and that's when he left this church. Now, I don't know whether that's edifying to you or not, but that's the background. I never disfellowshipped any of them. I have written apologies from Brother Vale where he apologized for what he said and did to me. And he said, that's my personality. He said, Perry, I admire you more than anybody I know in this message. But I have a tendency and a weakness that the people that I admire the most, I regulate them to the garbage dump. There have been people who have been friends of Brother Vale come here to see me, and they ask me, why does Brother Vale feel the way he does about you? And I said, how does he feel? And they would tell me things that he said. And then I pull that letter out, written in his own handwriting. And I say, here's what Brother Vale thinks of me. And you read it, and they say, can I have a copy of that? And I said, sure. He wrote it, and it's my letter. And I give it to him. And they go see Brother Vale about it. He said, I wrote that letter to Perry just to see what he'd do with it. Folks, I want to ask you something. How do you deal with somebody like that? I went to see Brother Vale. I asked him. He said, well, I wrote it in the letter. That's just the way I am. Brother Vale died. Brother Coleman died. I tried my best to restore fellowship with him. They wanted nothing to do with it. When Sister Vale died, I went to brother to her memorial service. And I saw Lee Neffendorf there, one of mine and Janice's boys, one of the first ones we had. And I didn't recognize him, and I wanted to apologize to him. So I went after the funeral service at the cemetery. I went back to the church, asked to see him, and Brother Vale asked me to sit at the head table with him. And when I sat there, Brother Vale told me, the first thing he told me was, I haven't preached for 30 months. And he started telling me things about uh, he'd forgotten us. And I said, Lee, you've probably forgotten more than most of us will ever know. And I said, I would like to say something to this congregation, though, about Sister Allison. And when I, when I got there that day, nobody would even speak to me, even in the restroom. Not in the cemetery, not in the church. But after I told Brother Vale I'd like to say something, he had the pastor bring me a microphone, and I stood up, and I told him how Allison had treated me the night that I had showed up with Brother Brown's body, delivered it to Mr. Coote, and then I'd gone looking for Brother Vale because I wanted some answers. I didn't have them. What were we going to do since God had taken the prophet off the scene? And when I went to the door, Brother and Sister Vale, about 1 o'clock in the morning, Sister Vale came to the door in her house coat, and when she opened the door, I started crying. And Sister Vale took me in her arms just like I was her son. And I hadn't had anybody comfort me for that week in the hospital in Amarillo. And she, like my mother, held me in her arms and prayed for me.
And I didn't forget that. I felt that's the way she really felt, felt about me. Then I told Brother Vail what I felt about Brother Branham, having him translate the books. And I will say this today, or, or punctuate them. I believe if Brother Branham was alive, he would want his books punctuated. I don't think he would want his books put out unabridged the way they are. And the reason I say that is because of what he said when we were doing the church age book. I don't think he would want it edited, but I think he would at least want it punctuated. Because he's the one who said to me, that makes me look like I have no brains at all. Brother Branham knew that he didn't have proper English, and you and I read it, and it's okay. Because we've learned to read that, and we appreciate it. But there are people, they just turn it down because of that. And if they do, I'd have to say that I believe now they're not predestinated Amen. to believe this message. I'm not saying they're lost, but I'll go back to it again. If God did nothing in vain, and it was necessary for John the Baptist to come to forerun his first coming, I think it's necessary if Brother Brown was sent to forerun the second coming for us to hear what he's got to say. Look at these prophets that we that I'm ap, have an opportunity to be fellowship with now. When Brother Joyner had his experience beyond in the throne room, and he went there and he saw Brother Branham sitting in an elevated position, and he wanted to see him and talk with him, and the the angel of the Lord told him, "No, you can't do that." But we wanted you to know what we thought about William Branham, and that. What he said was important, and you need to hear it. Now, that's a non-message man confessing that. And I've heard it, and I believe it. So what have I done? I've tried to help those people have access to Brother Brown's message. And you are the congregation that they look at as examples today, and Brother Shelley's. When they take, talk about message people, they think of you. They think of Brother Shelley's congregation. Those women that wear their pajamas for evening clothes, and that's what they look like. They've told the sisters in Brother Shelley's church, don't you girls change. We agree with what you're doing. We can see the picture of holiness in you. But here we are as message people, critical, want nothing to do with them, won't fellowship them, or we don't, but they are called, so-called, self-appointed prophets. I've had them say that to my face. And I want you to know that the one that said that to me, I asked him what he thought about Agabus in the Bible, and he said, Agabus who? I said, do you read your Bible? Yes. I said, you got a computer? Yes. Well, then won't you look at what Brother Branham had to say about Agabus? You know, the last time I tried to talk to him about that about two months ago, he didn't want to discuss the subject. You see, if you want to shut your mind to the truth, it does that. And I'm not, I'm not putting these other people out of the kingdom of God, but I'm telling you how easy it is for somebody to claim to be so right and be so wrong. Here was Brother Branham's comment. He'd rather be wrong in his doctrine and right in his spirit than to be right in his doctrine and wrong in his spirit. Now which one do we want to be? We want to be right in our spirit. Because if that's the case, then God can deal with us. But you people were here four or five years ago when I honestly tried to say, let's look and see what we got wrong on the seals. Yeah. Because it hasn't produced in our lives what it's supposed to produce. Or what any of us believe it is. And now then there, there are ministers in this state who want nothing to do with me. And they will tell you, all we preach is the seventh seal, the third pull, and the return ministry. Because I am so wrong. Told by lifelong friends that I, I was responsible for them even hearing about Brother Branham. Have told people they don't want to hear this garbage that Perry Green talks about. 
like it's going to affect them. They can sit right in front of me or stand right beside me and will not speak to me. Now that doesn't make them wrong. But I wouldn't want to have that spirit and face the Lord. There's something somewhere that needs to happen. And then it results in people putting out things like this. And I want to say that I believe it is wrong. Now, they want to quote Dr. James McDonald. Dr. McDonald was a professor of atmospheric physics at the University of Arizona. And it quotes him in this life article. And, and may I say, lest I forget it, that whenever I first came to this message, I wanted a copy of this magazine. I contacted Life Magazine and I bought their complete inventory. Everything they had cost me $1,785. $5 a magazine. And this is the first thing that I distributed. I should have kept them because they're worth about $125 each now. From people who follow this message who want them. But I never even got $5 for them. I gave them away. And when I ran out of them, people still wanted them. I, I took this, this picture, and I had Shirley Abbott at Abbott Studios in Beaumont, Texas, make me a copy of this. And I had her make it 11 by 15. And when she did that, she made it in a new process called duotone. As if it had been black and white, it was sort of a tan color with a gray. And you know, a photograph is just dots or pixels. And when she made that and gave it to me, I never noticed it. But when I gave Brother Branham one of them, that's the one that he turned sideways and he saw the eyes and the nose and the mouth. And he talked about it in July of 65 in Jeffersonville. After That day after he finished showing that to the church, he gave me that picture back and told me to have Uncle Doc put it on the bulletin board so that everybody could see it. The last time I was in Jeffersonville, I came through there with Brother Bernard Frank when we was coming back from, from the Congo in Germany and back here, and a brother led us into the tabernacle, and to my pleasant surprise, that 11 by 14 photograph is still on the bulletin board back by the water fountain in Branham Tabernacle under glass. And I don't think you could get anybody to unlock it and take it out, which I'm glad is still there. But then because of the comments Brother Branham said about seeing the face of Christ and so forth, they took it, and now then, they take the liberty to take the Hoffman's head of Christ and decoupage it over that, and they make them four by six in size in the Congo, put them up behind their pulpits, and now they're preaching their point and say, can't you see that Jesus came? Because they don't know that that wasn't the way the picture was taken. Shows you how easy it is to be deceived to somebody else's deception. It, it's the same way with the the picture in Houston. You know, it was made in black and white. Well, when I had Brother Brown's picture painted at, from the wedding that he had, I also had Mr. York, that Chinaman over there, paint the one of, of Brother Branham in the Houston photograph. And I asked Sister Branham the color of the suit and the tie and so forth, and she told me. And this man painted in color. And I brought those two photographs, 16 by 20, hung them in the tabernacle down here on stone, and Sister Branham liked them. And she asked me for them, and I gave them both to her. They took one of them and hung it in the tabernacle in Jeffersonville. People wanted a copy of it. I refused to make it in color because the picture was made in black and white. 
At that time, I felt checked in my spirit not to put it out in color, even though I have one of them hanging in my office just to show people. But Brother Billy Collins at that time was a photographer, and he took one, uh, took a picture of mine, or the one that I gave Sister Branham, and he started distributing it in color. And I thought, well, that's okay if that's the way people want it. You know, it looks nice. It's and and. You, you can see that here it is in color that they copied. I heard a brother from South Africa, not, not Brother Ashley Camel, but I heard him preach an hour and a half sermon on the color of this color of fire. I told him after the sermon, I picked these colors. Well, he disfellowshipped me. <laughs> Wanted nothing to do with me because this was his inspiration. Well, I didn't know it. When I told Mr. York the color to put it. Now, if you don't know the color, Brother Branham said that Cecil B. DeMille got it absolutely correct on the Ten Commandment movie. You know, I've never taken this and compared it with that to see if it's that right now, but... I remember hearing the brother from South Africa preach, and he wasn't Ashley, an hour and a half on the color of that pillar of fire. Now then, this is the one that most of the people won't, because it's prettier. But there are some black and white ones around here, and when we reprinted a few years ago, we made certain that this pillar of fire didn't run off the edge here. Because if it runs off the edge with any picture people bring me, I say, light got in your camera. And Brother Fred Sothman had a Polaroid camera that had a flaw, and every picture he took had it that way. And he would show it was the pillar of fire. And I think I've told you people the story about the house up here. They took some for Brother Elsie Maines and Brother Strahan, which is related to Billy Wiggins. And they, they, were, they were saying, look at that, the pillar of fire is old Brother Brown's swimming pool. And I'm working on the den, hanging some curtains my mother made. And I told them, I said, brothers, you know, there's a way to find out whether that's a pillar of fire or not. And they said, as I said, well, that lawyer across the street, I said, he's fought you all on everything you've done, zoning and all. I said, take a picture of his house and see if the pillar of fire is on it. Well, Brother Sothman didn't want to take that picture. So I asked Brother Maines who the film belonged to in that Polaroid camera. And he says, mine. I said, what do you want a picture of? He said, we've only got one left, but I want a picture of that house. So they went outside, and I kept hanging the curtains. A little while, they came back inside, and nobody said a word about that picture. But I noticed in Brother Sothman's shirt pocket, that picture was sticking in his pocket. I was hanging that big long curtain up there that's made out of toe sack material, I called it. And I was up on a ladder and I asked Brother Fred if he'd take a broom and hold his rod up here while I put a screw in it. And when he came over and did that, I reached down and took the picture out of his pocket. And I said, well, look at there. There's a pillar of fire over that lawyer's house. Now, Brother Sothman's gone, and I'm not criticizing it, but I'm telling the truth. Yeah. They didn't want the truth. They wanted to make Brother Bram something that he wasn't. Come on, Brother Come on. And, and let me tell you something. The reason I can say that Fred Sothman's wrong is because Brother Bram told me himself, Fred's wrong. Page 328 in the Church Age book. There are some that believe he's so-and-so. And Brother Brown was talking about Fred Sothman. And when I went to Brother Fred Sothman with these things after I moved to Tucson, I said, Brother Fred, you know, if Brother Branham had not told me you were wrong, I'd be concerned about myself. But because he told me you were wrong, it, it doesn't trouble me except for your own sake. 
But Brother Branham had told me one day, he said, Brother Green, they're wrong because they haven't had a pastor. I said, Brother Branham, you're their pastor. Brother Branham looked at me, he said, I'm not a pastor, I'm a prophet. He said, I'm supposed to go up in those mountains up there and hear from God and stomp out of there with thus saith the Lord. But he said, because I love people. He said, they'll be standing next to my car when I come out of the wilderness. Brother Brown, what happened? He said, and I'll tell them because I love people. But he said, Brother Green, God sent you out here so they'd have a pastor. So you tell them, and you tell them, and you tell them. And I stand in right over their own prints, and as Brother Brown said it, I counted on my fingers. You tell them, and 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 tell them. And I had seven fingers. Brother Brown told me seven times, said, you tell them, and tell them. And tell them, and tell them, and tell them, and tell them, and tell them. That's the reason I don't want to shut up about it. What would you do if Brother Branham had told you seven times to tell them they were wrong? And had told you that God sent you here so you could be a pastor to them to tell them. Now they don't want to claim me as a pastor. Because they don't want to tell they don't want me to tell them. I told Brother Fred, I said, Brother Fred, I'd really be worried if Brother Branham hadn't told me you were wrong. Let me tell you his answer to me. Well, Brother Branham told me things about you, too. I said, well, Brother Fred, they must have been good. He said, why do you say that? I said, because you hate me enough that if they'd have been bad, you'd have done told them. Right. Now, folks... I'm not smart enough to go with answers like that. deceptive in getting that picture. But folks, you don't know the times I've had to stand yes, sir. in the face of things like this. Come on, Brother Green. Come on. Brother. And that's the reason now at this age and my health the way it is, I'm like Peter. I'm not going to fail while I'm still here in this tabernacle. Amen. And I don't want you people taking it second-handed and trying to do my job. My commission, my calling, what I was brought here to do. Don't you do it. You're not called as I'm called to do it. And you may manifest a different spirit. And I don't want you to be guilty of that. I want you to be guilty of one thing, and that's loving those people. Amen. Being good to them. Going out of your way. And don't you ever defend me. Let God do that. And I'm not defending myself now. I'm telling you this so you can withstand their criticism for what you stand and hold true. Now, I told you that I read this article in Life magazine. I, uh, I read the article that he published in Science magazine and in Weatherwise. But before I ever read those articles, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. James McDonald. I think it was the second time that I came from Beaumont out here, and I was flying on Continental Airlines, because they're the ones that the only one that had a direct flight. You stopped at that time in San Antonio and El Paso and here, and on to L.A. That was a, a nightly run for about $65. And I got on the plane in Houston, and I was sitting next to Dr. James McDonald. When I found out who it was, it was so, that I just blurted right out, I've been wanting to meet you. And I had a copy of the cloud in my wallet. And I pull it out and I show it to him and I said, I understand you wrote some articles about this. And he wanted to know what you're interested in. And I told him that I was a minister. And that I, in my Bible, said something about the coming of the Lord, there'd be a cloud. And, and he wanted to make fun of me then. And I saw that he didn't want to hear my side of the story, so I, I just met him that night. That night and the next day, I told Brother Billy Paul that I'd met, brother, that I'd met Dr. James McDonald. Billy didn't know his first name. The next night, I go over here at a restaurant on First Avenue, and the reason I went is Brother Borders had told me that they served horse meat. And I'd never seen anybody that ate Chevelle. That's what they call it in French. You know, you don't call pork pig. You don't call horse horse if you order it in a restaurant. It's Chevelle. 
So I go over there to eat a horse steak or Chevelle steak. And Dr. McDonald is there at the bar. And he's inebriated. You know what that is? Yes. That's the way a professor gets drunk. <laughs> and I, I introduced myself again, and this time I was a little bolder. And he told me there was nothing religious about this cloud. And he said, I don't know what caused it. Nobody knows. And he's the one who mentioned to me about the articles of WeatherWise and, and, and the Science Magazine. Told me that World Book had asked for article on it. I saw but he didn't want to share any information. But I just uh, got those articles and I read them. And I saw that he didn't have any answer. And after I move out to Tucson and I'm passing out the Life magazine, Brother Branham begins to make some more comments about it. I meet people out here that about it. I found out that Brother Donnie works his brother Willard that lived here and he'd done rock work up on the den. And he'd been in Brother Branham's meetings and he was one of the sons of Granddaddy Works that I became friends with. And that he's the one that had a copy of the Life magazine on his coffee table in his home. And he showed Brother Gene Norman a picture of the cloud. Brother Norman borrowed the magazine from, from Willard Works and took and showed it to Brother Branham. Now it was published May the 17th. And on June the 1st, 1963, Brother Branham had a had a house meeting, or, or really it was a graduation celebration for Brother Gene Norman's oldest daughter, Norma, from high school. And Brother Branham, that 41 minutes that he was there, uh, he, he the talk that he gave, they entitled it, Come Follow Me. And it's June the 1st, 1963. And Brother Branham makes his comment that... Uh, Norma's father showed him an article and there was a supernatural picture of a cloud that nobody had an answer to and he said I looked at the date and it was a day or two before or a day or two after I was over there and it was animated. Now that this picture of the cloud was photographed February the 28th 1963 that's a fact there's no doubt about it no question about it that's what Life magazine said that's what Dr. McDonald said in his articles in Science and Weatherwise and the World Book. So when I did my book, Acts of the Prophet, in 69, I said Brother Branham was hunting in February the 28th, and there was probably ten or 15,000 people, plus others had read it, got it, that Brother Branham was over on February the 28th. And there was a debate up in Lima, Ohio area between one of the pastors up there and a Church of Christ preacher. And that Church of Christ preacher brought up the fact that your prophet, that you call him, was an illegal hunter. Because if he was hunting on February the 28th, he was hunting out of season. Because he had checked with the Arizona Game and Fish Commission and the hunting season for pigs that year and, and I may have this date one day wrong, was March the 5th through the 14th. It was nine days. And he said, if William Branham killed a pig on February 27th or 28th, he was hunting out of season. Well, the very night that that came up in Lima, Ohio, that pastor up there called me. And I said, well, brother, I don't know. I don't, I don't think Brother Branham would hunt out of season. And so the next day, I went to the Game and Fish Commission, and I got a copy of the license, and we have them over here for you to take if you want one of them, if you don't believe me. And it brought a question in my mind. Well, Adam wouldn't be hunting out of season. And then when we traced the look, I think it was Brother Sparks that helped me do that because that time we didn't have the index book on them. And Brother Sparks looked it up, and he said, Well, Brother Brown couldn't have been in the mountains on February the 28th because 
on March the 4th, he was in Houston, where he was in the city auditorium, and he preached a message about 51 minutes long called Absolute. And he was down there to try to get this Mr. Ayers, his son, who was condemned to murder, found guilty of a murder and condemned to hang or be electrocuted. And Brother Branham went down there to try to get the boy off a of death row. And Brother Sothman and Brother Norman went with Brother Branham. And that was the night of March the 4th. Well, there's no way that Brother Branham could have been hunting on February 28th and been in Houston on March the 4th. So I mentioned that to different brothers. And at that time, Rebecca Smith had just started her magazine, I Only Believe. She picked it up and she did some research on it and she wrote an article about it. Well, it brought the world of criticism down on us because we were trying to say that Brother Branham wasn't there when the cloud picture was taken. And I came to the conclusion after looking at it and talking to Brother Norman and Brother Sothman, they, they, they didn't remember the dates. But they told me that they drove back from Houston the night that Brother Branham preached the fourth. They got here on the fifth, and on the sixth they had gone hunting, got over there about midday, and Brother Branham had killed his pig that afternoon which was March the 6th. He killed his pig on the 6th, and then the very next day, he sent Fred and Gene around the mountain. He went up on top of the mountain, and the seven angels came down. That would have made the seven angels come in on March the 7th. Now, do you follow me? So that means that the angels were photographed in the heavens by the man who took their picture on February the 28th, and seven days later, those angels appeared to Brother Branham. Now, when Brother Branham makes the statement that those angels are there all the time, and then in 1989, when the Parade Magazine published that the Russian Ost uh, uh, cosmonauts had seen these angels in heaven, I didn't have any difficulty putting this together, that Brother Branham was in Houston. The, the cloud appeared on the 28th. Brother Branham went there on the 6th, killed his pig. And on the 7th, the angels appeared to Brother Branham. And the 14th, he was in Jeffersonville preaching the seals. Now, I don't see where that makes anything wrong. Brother Branham never said he was there on the 28th. He was in Houston. Brother Branham said a day or two for or a day or two after. But now then people want to take it and say that Brother Brown was totally wrong with it and that all this information was classified, it was caused by a rocket. Well, I guess the main thing I want to say about this is that we don't have any rockets to carry that much moisture up in the air. You know how much, how much water it would take to form a cloud that big? 26 miles wide? Or, let's see, it's 26 miles high and 45 miles long. It'll take tons of water. Dr. McDonald, even writing about it, says that there's no way that if that was caused by a rocket that had exploded, could it travel in the atmosphere where there's no winds and move that five or 600 miles to be photographed that day. Yeah. He gives no answer. In fact, in the science and the weather-wise, he says, there is no answer. Well, there was a brother from Sweden or Switzerland one. I can't remember which one it was. He came to my home out at Grace Ranch. And he went to see Dr. McDonald at the, at the University of Arizona. And Dr. McDonald told him he had 80-something photographs of that cloud and other clouds. And he mentioned there being two clouds. And then there was a brother from California who came to see Dr. McDonald. And Dr. McDonald told him more or less the same thing. And he, he Dr. McDonald asked both of them, 
What is all this religious significance being put on this cloud? There's nothing religious about this. It's just a mystery we don't have an answer to. And each time Dr. McDonald called me because they told him, well, well if you want to know, know anything about it, uh, you, you call Reverend Green. And Dr. McDonald did call me. And I reminded him that we had met on the airplane and over here at the bar. Then I met David Davies. He was a newspaper reporter that lived in Phoenix. And he wanted to write a feature article on this and sell it to the Phoenix newspaper for their Sunday magazine. He did. He came down and spent time with Dr. McDonald. He interviewed me. And again, they, it was repeated that there was two clouds. And when it was published in the newspaper in Phoenix, distributed all over Arizona, Dr. McDonald got very angry. And he called me and told me, he said, all this is superstition. And he even says in the article, Reverend Green should keep the superstition in the 14th century where it belongs. Well, I called Dr. McDonald again, and, and I asked him if the things that the newspaper had quoted him in saying was true. And he said, no, they misquoted me. I said, well, is it possible they misquoted me? And again, he told me I was just a superstitious preacher. Well, the next thing I heard about Dr. McDonald was that he was in the Veterans Hospital where he had endeavored to commit suicide. And then I heard that he'd been released. And he had succeeded in committing suicide. And there was going to be a memorial service for him in the Unitarian Church over here on 22nd Street. Brother Sidney Jackson was in town. And I got Brother Jackson and Brother Morconda, and we went to that memorial service. Uh, I really didn't know what the Unitarians believed, but I don't think they're too much on God or the supernatural or Jesus Christ. And when the memorial service started, there was a, a neighborhood lady. She got up and she testified to all of us what a wonderful neighbor Dr. McDonald was. How kind and helpful he was. How he helped her children in school with her homework. The next one he got up was one of his fellow professors. That professor said that Dr. McDonald was so intelligent and, and so wise in his counsel and what he did that if, if you had a project that you didn't have an answer, a theory, and you would talk to James about it, as he called him, he said James could right away do away with your theory and show you where you were wrong or else he'd already investigated himself. And then he said something I thought to be very strange. He said, in fact, James McDonald just didn't limit himself to atmospheric physics. He said, in fact, his last project was he was studying the organs of the body, whether it was the lips, the tongue, the lungs, the throat, what portion of the body was used to suck spaghetti into the mouth? I looked at Brother Jackson. I said, the man's insane. Here's a scientist making tens of thousands of dollars a year working at the U of A, spend his time to figure out how to suck spaghetti in the mouth. I said, little babies can do that. Then his, one of his sons got up, and he had a couple of notebooks. And he said his father had practiced all of his life of reading things that people said, and he'd write down quotes and facts in, that, in those books that uh, he thought would do good for him in life and he could give people advice with. And uh, I didn't take the time to look my notes up on this, but there's one that I remember. And one of his notes said, be sure that you have all the facts before you express an opinion. I told the two brothers of me, I said, he didn't obey that. 
He didn't have all the facts because the last time I'd had a telephone conversation with him, he had mentioned to me about there was two clouds. And he didn't have an explanation for either one of them. And I said to him, Dr. McDonald, if you had an explanation for either one of them, I wouldn't be able to believe what I believed about them. But because you say you have no explanation, and there is no explanation, therefore I can believe they were supernatural, and I can believe what Brother Branham said about them. Yes. Well, that, that service had been about 45 minutes long. And then there was a young girl, her name was Nancy. I was told later she was 18 years old. And it was his youngest daughter. And she got up, and I'm going to do my best to say it just like she said it. She said, I've sat here for almost an hour. And listen, people tell you what a wonderful man my father, James McDonald, was. And how intelligent he was. And said he was so intelligent that he thought that he could solve everything in life with his intelligence. He had no emotions. And as a result of that, he could never tell my mother that he loved her. My mother asked him for a divorce. And when he couldn't answer that with his intelligence and his reasoning and his books, he took a gun and like a little boy, and that's her words, he tried to shoot himself. And he only succeeded in blinding himself with a powder burn. And he was in the veterans hospital recovering from partial blindness. Said upon his discharge, he again obtained a gun, took a taxi cab, and went up in the Ina and First area off of Interstate 10 and blew his brains out. Do you know where Ina and First is? Yes, sir. Right behind Brother Bram's den. That made me think of something that Brother Gene Norman had told me. That he and Brother Brandon were fishing down at Pina Blanca Lake. And there was a game warden came up there. And Brother Branham had had a pole out. And he'd walked away from it to get a drink or something at the concession stand. And when he came back, that game warden was there giving Brother Branham a ticket. Brother Branham explained to him that there was no bait on his hook. He just left it there because keeping him getting tangled up. And this man was rude to him. And that two weeks later, that man committed suicide. I also heard that there was another person that had uh, got out of line with Brother Branham. And he'd done something that was maybe a frivolous or something and that within a week that man was dead and died because of that but there were people that were just that serious about Brother Branham and I want to say now so that these people on this website can hear this you're gambling with your life uh, I told Brother Billy and Brother Gordon Doyle here a while back because there were some people up there working where they are that had said something about us being a cult. And I told Brother Billy and Brother Gordon and him, I said, I don't want you to say anything to those people about Brother Branham or about Tucson Tabernacle because I said, I don't want you to be responsible for causing those people to burn their mouth. There was a time when a so-called believer had some very unkind things about me, in fact, threatened my life, said he was going to kill the brown bear. He was ordained of God, and he got other people to agree with him. Even wrote it in a letter, which I think I've still got. And I've said like this, you can say anything you want to about me. 
But I'm going to give you a piece of advice. You lay off of Brother Branham. I don't think God will let you get away with it. With me, it may not matter. But I don't think you need to blaspheme. And sometimes it's better not to say something to some people if it's going to motivate them to say something negative about Brother Branham. I don't know how anybody can talk about Brother Branham and tell people like there's been some young people in our church that people who claim to have known Brother Branham and love him to get them to go to a Baptist church. How can you do that without talking against Brother Branham and his teachings on the Trinity? You can't do it. So it's like this. If you can't say anything good about him, don't say anything at all. That's right. Amen. Me, help yourself. But I'd advise you to lay off of Brother Branham. And to say that Brother Branham's prophecies are false, and to say they're hit and miss, and undependable? Especially when he said they were true. So the cloud picture was taken on February the 28th. Life magazine published it. Brother Branham said it, saw it, and said it was a day or two before he was out there, and we know he was in Houston. I believe those seven angels came to Brother Branham. And I don't think anybody's got a right to judge it. Just be careful with it. I do not believe it is correct or right or righteous or true for people to put Hoffman's picture in the middle of that cloud. That's just... You may say, well, I know better. But the poor brother who printed this for an invitation to his convention doesn't know any better. The brothers in the Congo didn't know any better. And they had been so brainwashed with it that they didn't even want to hear from me. And I witness that that was man-made. Dr. McDonald is dead. I'm not saying that he's dead because of what he said about Brother Branham. But I'm stating two facts. He said things he shouldn't have said that were not righteous. They were blasphemy. They were abomination. And he is dead. His own daughter said at his memorial service, as a result of my father's intelligence, he was not able to say to my mother that he loved her. He could not show his emotions. Therefore, my mother asked him for a divorce. And him, like a little boy, he couldn't solve his problem, so he killed himself. And here's her words. My father is not an example for anybody to follow. End of meeting. That was the last thing said. There wasn't even a dismissal. Nobody wanted to say anything. And we all got up and walked out of the building. I found out later that Brother Dave Green knew her. Because he had somewhere done some work for them and he had met Nancy. I've had no contact with the family or any of those people since then. But that's my testimony to you about the cloud. Thank you for listening today. Okay? Drink of water. I'd open it up for questions, but you might ask me something I don't know. 
I wish people wouldn't do this. Because I don't like for anybody to be deceived. Now, I, I don't question whether they believe this or not. But this is what you can take Brother Brown's message and you can come up to believe this. And, and Brother Ashley Campbell paid a price. He moved from South Africa to Australia. And now then, this is a result he's still spreading. So nobody's changed him. It's even worse. Deception is a fearful thing. We'll stand together. Lord, would you would you look upon me in mercy tonight if I've said something today that hadn't been edifying or has hindered your people? But I've said it, Lord, because I, I believe that as your prophet told Brother F.F. F. Bosworth, we won't defend ourselves, but we'll defend the scriptures. Lord, I, I don't want this to defend myself, but I want to defend what I believe to be very precious and true. And that is that you sent a prophet to this generation. And you gave us certain evidences to believe. And as Dr. Stanley, one of your servants that of the Chaldean Catholic Church, said these things don't make us believers but they encourage us if we already believe help us Lord to keep our balance in your scriptures in your word which is infallible your prophet never claimed to be infallible but if he was speaking your words they are true and they are infallible but because he said it he says he was a man and his words would fail. Help us, Lord, not to just see those things and let that be what we follow. But let us see the things that was of yourself. Because I believe his prophecies that you had spoken through him was for my edification. May you come quickly, Lord. And may there be peace in Jerusalem, is my prayer. Amen. Amen. We're very close to things happening in the Middle East. And I believe they'll happen quickly. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Thank you for your patience today. I may continue Wednesday night with some other things that they said. Uh, and and it is not my physical strength, but Brother Bram talked about the virtue. I, I felt my strength today waning as I went along. And these these preachers, they can tell you about that. But, but I want to be faithful in whatever I do. Amen. You pray the Lord forgive me if I've said it wrong. Amen. God bless you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. I love you, adore you. I bow down before you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. God bless you tonight. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. to say this during the service, but maybe it's best now. Uh, I've noticed today that even while Sister Green was singing, that some of you were taking pictures with your camera, with your telephones. Now, your flash on your telephone 
will not reach up here. It will not make your picture one way or the other, better or worse. But every time you do that, it distracts from this pulpit. Now, you, you'd have to be up here to see how many times it happens. But you can be speaking and somebody all of a sudden thinks they want to pick. Uh, I know you're doing it respectful, but it's very distracting. So I'm going to ask you to abstain from it. Now, if, if you've got a supernatural picture or something, nobody's going to believe it but you and maybe some of us. So today it was distracting. And, and I'm going to ask you not to do it. Okay? God bless you.